today, what I'm going to do is just talk briefly about two things. One will be the cost of publishing and how we, how we deal with this cost of publishing with, our, with some of our external partners and recognizing reviewers and editors. So let's start with a statement that you have all heard. You've read about it in editorials. You've heard it from your colleagues. Open access publishing is expensive. And when we talk to the uh, editorial, the, the academic communities, we send out surveys, we also get that feedback. People tell us that this is a major frustration for them, having to find the funds to pay for the cost of open access publishing. So let's take a look at the cost of publishing an article under two or three publishing models. We'll start with subscription. There are some bibliometric studies out there that show that the range of publishing an article, the cost to society of publishing an article in a subscription title is somewhere between $4,000 and $9,500 per article. We can also look at some annual reports and get a sense that of, of, a, of a couple of costs per article, and we see that they do fall within that range. If we add to that, the data for the cost of publishing a hybrid article. So as you know, a hybrid article is an article that's published in a subscription journal, but an uh, a article pu pu publishing charge is paid in addition to open that article on the day of publication. You see already that there is a drop in the, in the cost per article under the hybrid model. And now we add the APCs for the gold open access model. And again, you see a movement. But if we, draw, if we trace a line to guide the eye, what we see is that the, the pure gold open access publishers are actually doing a pretty good job on, a, on, on the cost, on the value, uh, on a per article basis. And in fact, if you compare that with the cost of, on, a, on a per article basis for subscription, there's about a factor of two to three difference. If we summarize this in, a, in, in this plot, the gray box represents that range of costs for subscription, to, uh, subscription articles. The, the orange box, $3,400 on average for an APC in a hybrid model, and the yellow box, $2,300 for an APC in a gold open access title. Now, if we were to transfer all of the articles that are being published in the gray box to the orange box and the yellow box, we would save in the first year something on the order of $7 billion in publishing expenditures. $7 billion saved in addition to the gain in, on, on return on investment that is supported by the open science dynamic that, that Camila was talking about. So this is just, a, this is just an accounting gain and moving from one model to the other. So the, it is a fact that open access is driving down the cost of publishing. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not raising the costs, it's lowering the costs. Let's just stop for a second and think about how much further can we take down these costs? Well, I would say that we should have this discussion only in the context of, of reassuring ourselves that as a responsible publisher, we would never push down the costs below a threshold that would have a negative impact on quality. But here is a rough diagram, a uh, box diagram, of how we allocate the, the uh, income that we, we receive for APCs that are paid for by institutions across the various services and departments at, at Frontiers. On the right-hand side, you can see many of the functions that allow Frontiers to operate at a as a business to get the job done and to support our editorial boards and, uh, and, and our authorship. But I'm just going to say a quick word about the two biggest boxes, journal and review operations. Now, Miriam is going to go into deep detail about the, how many of these different uh, functions work. I'd just like to point out research integrity, for example. Camilla alluded to the fact that we're, we have to do a much, much better job in, t in terms of making sure that the articles that go into review are only those that deserve to go into review. That's costly. It's costly to, 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 for our teams to hire the, 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 the people that you all work with from day to day to, to, to manage your editorial boards and to work together with you with content acquisition and everything else that you do when you, when you run a journal from day to day. Now we look at the second box, tech technology and innovation. Now, our, te our technology team has built this entire suite of applications of, of, uh, of the, the platform services also that you use every single day. And they are the team that has developed this, they're, they're, they're expanding it, and in particular, they're working hard now on integrating uh, artificial intelligence 
along each of the stages of the, of, of the uh, editorial process. As Daniel likes to say, it's about finding the right technology and wrapping it around the entire editorial flow so that you can get your job, jobs done, to enable our editorial boards and our, our frontons to, to, to make, it, make it happen. So why does this perception of cost of open access remain when we see that actually the fact is that there's a huge potential to lower the costs and we've also seen that a responsible publisher like Frontiers is not going to try to cut corners at all? Well, the, the reason for this very largely just has to do with the fact that open access is making these costs transparent, and people are seeing what the real costs are for the publication of a quality article. Um, people have spent, have worked for generations not knowing exactly how much they're paying for their publishing services. Um, so this is a, uh, this is a hard problem, but it's not a problem that frontiers that we're going to be able to solve by ourselves. What we, what, what we need to do is work with the legacy publishers and ask them to be a little bit more transparent in their reasoning about their own pricing. And we have to ask the funders and the policymakers also to put a little bit of pressure on everybody that's working in this space so that we all we have a better understanding of what these costs really are. And um, we are not going to solve the, this problem on our own. There is another group that is fairly frustrated by this lack of transparency and, and, and that is our colleagues that work in the libraries. They also see this lack of transparency as something, as a commercial tactic. They see it as a way of extending the status quo of, the, of subscription publishing, and they, and, they, and, and they do not like the fact that they feel locked into these institutional subscription budgets. Here's a quote from a librarian that I talked to a few weeks ago. What he said was, we see that Frontiers is a quality open access publisher, but at our university, the library budgets have not increased since 2017, and the resources required for large transformative agreements make it impossible to provide more funding for open access services. So you see, he's not seeing open access, he's not seeing the potential to lower costs, he's seeing it as an additional cost. And this is something that we have to work to, to solve. And you can see exactly where his pro why he has this problem. This is data from, from ESAC that shows the, the breakdown of the fraction of subscription against open access content by publisher. And what you see immediately here is that although the publishers are slowly moving towards an open access context, the bedrock of the business of, of these companies remains in this, solidly in the subscription model. And it's the, the negotiation of the deals that the institutions pay for that lock them into these subscription deals. Dr. Vidmark of, of the Swedish Consortium stressed the fact that what he wants to see and what librarians want to see are simple and transparent partnerships. We are worried that the publishers want to make the current agreements permanent and we do not think that they are advantageous for our university system in the long term. If we stay with what we have, we, have to, we, we would have to pay both to read and to publish articles and there will be hybrids. While some articles are open and some are not, we want to see a change to how publication is funded. Now, I think here we can help. We have started talking with our institutional partners about different ways for them to be able to pay for their services in a way that is, that, that, that is more convenient for them and which takes into account, for example, their budgetary cycles. But before I talk about that specifically, I would just point out the fact that Frontiers has always been on the forefront of having these types of discussions with our partners. We were a pioneer in engineering the, the national consortia deals, and now we have 10 of these deals with, with, with a var various uh, national consortia. And we've also worked quite effectively with funders, making sure that their processes and our processes are integrated so that we save, we save money, that we make the process much more efficient for them when they support a Frontiers article. So the result of this is that we now have over 650 simple and transparent contracts with w institutions around the world. One thing that these agreements tend to have in common is that they're all based on the payment of the APCs that their communities publish with us at Frontiers. This, this is hard for institutions to manage because at the beginning of the year they don't know 
how many articles they might have to pay for. So we're talking to a growing number of our partners about turning this around a little bit, and we tell them, look, let's work together in a way where you pay one fee at the beginning of the year. We'll, we'll negotiate a, a, a number which is right for you and right for us. And then after that, it's unlimited publishing for all the people in your community. So it's one fee, unlimited publishing. This enters into their budgetary cycle, and, um, and this is something that, that we hope is actually going to help them drive this transition to, to, to open science. The authors would very much benefit from a system like this. They would never have to deal with an invoice, and, they would, and every paper they submit to Frontiers, they would know that they have the backing of their institution. For, the, for our institutional partners, there are also a number of, of immediate benefits. They have the simplicity and transparency of, of this type of new deal, and then we would also provide them with, with dashboards so in real time they have oversight of how that resource is being used by their community. A reduced administrative hassle and better value for the service they get from Frontiers. So our first partnerships, they're currently under negotiation, and I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to make the first announcements very soon. Now, I'm going to say one word, um, many words probably, about community recognition. Um, in 2022, Frontiers provided almost $23 million in fee support to authors on 16,000 articles. We have always been very careful to, to work with our communities and make, to make sure that any author who works at an institution who is not capable of paying a full or a partial APC, why we, we, we provide them with the fee support they need so that they, they can publish their article with us. 16,000 articles last year, representing tens of thousands, tens of thousands of authors. So we support the authors. And as many of you in this room know, we also are, I think, rather generous in supporting the editorial leadership with awards, with, with, the, with the honoraria that we award, award to this year, over 1,500 chief editors benefited from our honorarium program. So we support the authorship, we support our editors, and the question that we hear more and more often is, what about our associate editors? What about the review editors? Please, Frontiers, offer more benefits to editors and reviewers. And again, this was also a subject that came up quite frequently during our discussions yesterday afternoon. So, it, some of you probably rem remember that it, the last time we got together, uh, we talked a little bit about rolling out a recognition program. And what we did at that point in time, we decided that we were going to provide vouchers to authors or reviewers that, that worked for us so that they could use that against their, the next APC. We realized that that was off target, that what we needed to do was, that was something that had a much stronger community focus. You see, um, people were saying, but I work at an institution that has an institutional agreement. I don't, I don't need a voucher. I have funding available from my, 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 the, the funder, from, the, from the, the, the agency that's provided my grant. So what can, what can we do about that? So we went back to the drawing board, and we decided that we would think carefully about how to roll out this recognition scheme based, starting at first principles. It would have to be a fair system and a, with the flexibility for, for, for researchers to make sure that it's inclusive. It would have to be community-oriented, again, so that it's not about, not strictly about supporting one person for the work they did for an article that they're going to publish. It has to be tightly tied into recognizing quality in the review process. And it has to be sustainable for frontiers, for authors, and for institutions. And by sustainable, I'll just, you know, if you think about it for a second, this year we will receive on the order of 350,000 submissions, perhaps. Now, if you, if you take into account that you have two and a half reviewers on average per paper plus a handling editor, you're talking about a million editorial assignments that, would that might fall into the context of a program like this. So we really have to make sure that it enables, that it dr pulls our community together and that it's effective in terms of achieving what we need to achieve with this. So the first thing, our customer experience team went out, surveyed, probably many of you were contacted in terms of a, 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 in a survey or, or an interview, and um, the feedback was generally quite positive, 65% we're, 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 we're positive, but as Camila likes to point out, we, we tend to focus on the red. So we spent a lot of time talking to the 7% to figure out what, 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 what aspect of what we were doing, why, what, what was their objection based on. And actually this feedback was very useful in, in going through this iterative process and building a, a prototype. 
We asked about APC support, and it, APC support was popular, but then it was also very much, a third of the people said that they would really like to see a community, a community supported way of, of using any of the points that they get from their editorial activities. 10% said they did not see any proposed options as adequate. And again, we're talking with these people to see about expanding the catalog of options for the people who, who, who get points through the system. Now, let me just take you a quick walk through a, um, the, the, the current prototype. You've just finished your review assignment, and you, 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 click, you, you click on the, your decision. A screen comes up and says, OK, now you've, you've, you've successfully completed your task. You, you, you're, you, you are eligible for 1,000 points. You click to learn more. You go to a landing page, instructions, some information, um, and, and you scroll down and you say, OK, here are some redemption options for the points that, that, that I've accumulated. You see we have my costs, a colleague's costs, a community, a, a, a section-based, perhaps research topic project or a, towards the, 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 uh, the costs of setting up a, a workshop. These are the types of options that we're thinking about. And then some statistics on the bottom of the page in terms of where you stand in terms of the accumulation of your own points and then the points that, that, that you're pulling together at the community level. So I'm just going to finish by one more time putting an enormous emphasis on the fact that this is all about quality. This is about working together with our editorial boards and making sure that every stage of the process is, is, is moving forward adequately. There will be peer ratings, there will be monitoring systems, and there will be ways to measure uh, quite precisely how well this, this, this program is, is working in terms of helping us achieve what we need to achieve. So I'm just going to finish by saying that I hope that what I told you this morning helps you understand a little bit about how working with our partners and working with our editorial boards, we are investing to accelerate the transition to open science. Thank you very much.